this is going to be um, our subject this evening. Uh, as I said, it's uh, based on a book by Robert Schindler, though I've done a lot of other research. And uh, Robert Schindler was basically writing about a man called uh, John James Kendon, who was born in 1830, died 1903, and came to Goudhurst. Now, why are we thinking about Kent? It's known as the Garden of England, and uh, one area has a particular rich history, and it's called the Weald of Kent. Once covered in oak forest, the soil and the climate are really good for hops, especially the Medway Valley. And Kent also um, had charcoal, um, uh, had, had uh, oak forests for the charcoal to use in the hop kilns. Now, this is a very familiar site. I have never forgotten somebody visiting me from Norfolk, and he said, what are those strange looking buildings? Well, of course, we who live in Kent know very well that they're called oast houses, and they're very distinct. They're a very important part of our county's heritage. And uh, these, of course, now are mainly converted for people to live in. Um, uh, there were several in our village that were converted to people to live in. They did say that the, the cowl would rather creak at night, and uh, it, it wasn't always the best noise to hear at night. Yeah. And uh, 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 this is what uh, the inside of a hop mm. kiln would look like, a hop uh, oast house would look like. There would be uh, three rooms, basically a kiln uh, where the fire uh, was burning, a drying room above it, and uh, then a cooling room where the hops were dragged before being pressed to be taken to market. The whole point of the cowl on the top was to ensure there was a good draw for the fire to keep um, a good heat going. So here is uh, a picture of a hop, if you haven't ever seen one before. Um, uh, as you see, uh, beer makes me hoppy. Well, I'm sitting down tonight um, so that uh, I, I can keep my head in the camera. Um, uh, we, we forget, perhaps, that at one time um, this was the most popular drink in England. Um, generally speaking, alcohol-wise, it would have been slightly weaker and it was a nutritious alternative to water and popular with the workers who were thirsty um, and in need of energy. And of course, it was safer being alcoholic to drink than some of the water because the alcohol would kill the bacteria. Um, many uh, workers had um, a beer allowance and I have certainly read uh, church histories where the pastor had uh, a beer allowance. Um, Adrian's listening tonight. I. I uh, don't know what representation you will make about that in a few moments, but uh, certainly some did. Um, small beer that we might have heard of was d diluted um, for children or for the poor. So what about the making um, of beer? Well, uh, uh, the, the brewers would use malted barley as the main short source of fermented sugar, and the hops would add the flavour. The hops, of course, are the flowers of a plant called Cumulus lupulus, and uh, they add bittering. And I'm told, I'm only told, that they impart floral, fruity or citrus flavours and aromas. I, I really can't judge that. Uh, I, I, I just hear that being said. Uh, I, they are also used in other beverages um, and herbal medicines. Now, what happened was that the Kent Yeoman farmers discovered that a few acre, acres of hops could be as profitable as 50 acres of arable. And in the 19th century, hops became Kent's most important crop. Yields in Kent were greater than those grown in any other county. For instance, 125 pounds per acre profit would be gained from hops, that was set against 10 to 12 pounds an acre for arable farming. That were the, those were the figures in 1857. Of course, prices were variable due to weather or disease um, and attack by aphids and hop dogs. Now, there is a hop dog. My mother used to talk about hop dogs. I had no idea what she was meaning, but it's a very large and prickly caterpillar. 
And I think as a young lady, my mother didn't particularly enjoy um, handling hop dogs. In 1875, 43,000 acres were dedicated to hops. Now that equates to 51% of all green hops in the county and 9% of agricultural land use. So you can see what an important crop it was in the county of Kent, uh, both in the 19th century and uh, also earlier. Whitbread's farm, which some of you might have visited with the many, many oast houses at Beltring, uh, was 300 acres in size and in the hop picking season employed some 5,000 pickers. So uh, hops are very important and have played a significant role in the county of Kent. So how do you go about growing a hop? Well, it's a, a vigorous climbing herbaceous plant and it's trained to climb up string, strings in a hop garden. The plants will uh, grow up from a crown uh, with shoots and vines and they will go up to 25 feet high. Uh, they will have tap roots that go deep into the earth. In fact, they go quite well on, on a difficult soil. They're a better crop to grow on some soils than other crops. So in March, there would be stringing. So, but first of all, there would be created a hop garden. Now, my um, paternal grandfather, I believe, looking at his uh, yard, um, made hop poles amongst other things. Um, and uh, these poles would be used in the field to, to build up um, uh, a, 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 a structure to have wires and strings across it for the hops to grow up. Those of you who are familiar with growing runner beans will, will know the principle. And uh, the stringing would be done with the aid of a stringing pole hooking up to over 20 feet on the ground. Now, how about that old gentleman? Um, we might think that uh, that would be a game for young people, but clearly uh, they, the, the, that kind of <laughs> uh, work was, was done by, by people in the hop uh, gardens, uh, stringing up the hops. Uh, in March, the shoots would be twiddled or trained clockwise on each string, and by May they would be established. And there's the, the, the early hops beginning to grow um, up. Um, and the picture on the left, the older picture taken from the book, um, shows them uh, when they're ready for picking. Um, so how was the harvest um, performed? By the middle of July, the hops had reached full height. And then as the daylight hours began to shorten, it triggered the plant to come into burr and then flower or the cone would develop. So the hop harvest would start in early September and uh, could, would continue often well into October, depending on the season. How were they harvested? They'd cut down the whole bine, that's the string as well, and then the hop flower would be separated from the rest by the pickers and uh, put into a bin. Each family would have a bin and the bin would be emptied each day and measured with a basket called a bushel basket. A man called a tally man would record how many bushels each family had picked. Now there is a picture of the tally man and he will be able to weigh and measure exactly what each family has picked on that particular day. Now I do understand that um, the pickers, uh, if um, George Orwell is right, um, only got paid two D, two old pence uh, uh, a, a bushel. So with the lightness of the hops, you certainly had to work hard to make a meaningful income. So the hops would be bagged and then they would be taken to the oast. Um, and there's a tally man. Um, I, I presume each thing would measure what a family um, had gathered. When they were taken uh, away, they were, had 80% moisture, um, and that was obviously reduced in the oast house down to about 10%, and then it was baled into 60 kilogram bales. There they would load them up on the horse and cart, 
and uh, thence they would be taken on to the Oast House and up into the top of the Oast House and uh, the man at the bottom would be caring for the fire. When they were sufficiently dried, they would be taken to the London market. And um, I don't think uh, they had particular regard for health and safety um, in 1934, um, because there is a fantastic load of hops going from Kent up to the London market. So obviously this is a very important industry in Kent, a very busy industry and it would need an increase of workers um, at harvest time. Well, obviously local people like my mother and others like that would have um, certainly muscled in on, on the local farms, but there wouldn't have been sufficient workers to get the crop in in time, because obviously they had to get it just right. Uh, the hops uh, had to be taken when they were ready, otherwise they would spoil. So uh, there would be people who would uh, come in their thousands uh, from poverty, particularly. Yeah, Julia rang to say Norma was doing the talk for the ladies and men's meeting All right. on the hot pictures of Ken. Oh, right. I just got to the bit with him. Careful, you're not, you're on mute, are you? Oh. Uh, okay, I haven't got anybody asking for admittance that I know of. <laughs> Okay, uh, you're with me still, guys. I'll carry on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, East Enders particularly would flee from the East End of London. It was often called the Londoner's Holiday or the Annual Hop. And for many, it was the nearest thing they would come to having a holiday. And it was often the only opportunity for the children to run around in fresh air and breathe uncontaminated factory smoke. And also it presented an opportunity to make some pocket money for the families coming down. The farmers would send out hop cards through the post every year, allocating families a particular, uh, a place on a particular farm. Uh, these uh, cards were often fought over and a black market developed in stolen or forged cards. Often whole streets would decamp and uh, this mass exodus saw families packing up their possessions and their animals and setting off for Kent. Um, great headwear there, um, some lovely old photos um, that show uh, what times uh, were like in those days. John Bickerdyke describes the scene. The high road from London to the hop fields of Kent presents a curious appearance immediately before the hop picking season. A stranger might imagine that the poorer classes of a big city are flying before an invading army. Grey-haired, decrepit old men and women are seen to be are to be seen painfully crawling along, their stronger sons and daughters pressing on impatiently. Once there, they would sheep sleep in sheds, sleeping on straw stuffed mattresses cooking on fires outside with farmers providing fruit and vegetable, end of quote. Now, railways provided hop pickers a special fare to cater for the families traveling to Kent from London. Some even came from the black country and some from Wales. Large numbers started with the coming of the railway in 1868, when there was a mainline service from London Bridge to Tunbridge, Paddockwood, Mardin, Staplehurst, and on to Pluckley, near where I come from. And from there, they would uh, travel on horse-drawn wagons or trailers or on foot to their camps and hovels in the hop garden. Margaret Lawrence, who, um, is, was, uh, whose husband uh, is a friend of Eric, the late Eric and Natalie, has written about uh, the hop pickers and she said at the, hop, uh, at the peak of the hop picking season in the mid 19th century, over 80,000 people came to Kent to pick hops. In fact, in 1907, Kent County's medical officer estimated that there were 75,000 
people who'd come into the county of Kent, into the hop fields. So what were conditions like? Well, mm. at first, they were very poor. Any provision for seasonal workers was virtually non-existent. Many would sleep rough, or some would have roughly constructed canvas shelters provided by the farmers. In 1860, when J.J. Kendon, more of him later, uh, arrived, he was appalled at the state of the pickers. His first report was a powerful condemnation of this ignored social problem. This is what he said. They sleep almost like cattle in the field. To mingle with these poor creatures, to see their habits and hear their language, to witness the awful lengths to which they go, makes it seem almost impossible that we can be living in the 19th century. Now, that was J.J. Kendon who came down to Kent from the east end of London, so he wasn't a stranger to poverty and squalid conditions. The uh, squalor and the overcrowding that the hoppers suffered was increased by local prejudice and discrimination. It was common for the locals to call the, pick, the pickers foreign people. And many pubs would put up notices. No dogs, no gypsies, and no hoppers. Oh, but the hopping families accepted this as cheerfully as they accepted the squalid accommodation that wasn't provided. Of course, many Irish travellers and gypsies... Sorry, I've jumped one head. Beg your pardon. I've got to go back. I've done a double click. Oh, so many Irish um, travellers and gypsies uh, joined the pickers. Now, in 1853, there was a terrible accident when a horse and cart fell off Hart Lake Bridge over the Medway near Hadlow. Uh, there were 37 people in the cart returning to their home from the hop fields. And the river was swollen and the horse panicked and kicked the bridge and the cart went over into the swollen river. 30 out of the 37 lost their lives. An inquest declared it an accident, but the bridge was badly maintained and local farmers avoided it. But I think possibly because they were all travelers, there wasn't a great deal of interest. But one person who did take an interest and a concern for them was Robert Schindler. He was then the pastor at Matfield, and he wrote a tract reminding people of their need to be prepared to meet the Lord. So this is the condition of the hoppers. When, Ken when Kendon arrived, he soon began campaigning for improvements. And this led to the formation of the Society for Employment and improved lodgings for hop pickers. That began in 1866. And bylaws covering hop pickers accommodation were adopted in Kent under the Sanitary Acts Amendment Act in 1874. And it required that a hopper hut be provided. It would have been either nine by nine feet or eight by 10 feet. Originally, they would have been made of timber, but later on corrugated iron sheets were used to clad them. After 1850, some were built in brick. They generally had an earthen floor and were lit either by candles or by paraffin lamps. The uh, sanitation would uh, be provided by a single toilet block. Uh, water would come from a standpipe uh, within 150 yards and uh, the earth closet of the uh, toilet block would usually be kept well away from that. There'd be a dedicated cookhouse because the farmers didn't want them having fires in the hopper huts. The basic bedding was provided, hay, ferns and straw. 
and faggots and a palace palace eh? so obviously the cooking had to be done outside and i think there's some of the uh very early hopper huts in that very old photo on the right hand side of my screen there they are they're cooking their meals outside um because they can't do it inside so it's very very basic a bit like a, a camping holiday there's uh, uh, some slightly better huts and a crowd of people outside they've probably been gathered for a meeting by um, JJ Kendon. So here he is, this is JJ Kendon, and he was born in Bethnal Green in 1830. He was the son of a silk weaver, and he took up that trade himself. He was converted to Christ in 1847, and uh, through a Mr. Reed of the London City, uh, and his conversion was through uh, a Mr. Reed who worked for the London City Mission. His conversion led to his concern for the poor East, East Enders, and he began to study in the evenings so he could adequately, adequately teach and preach, and he began to visit the sick in the terrible hospitals. This busy life, coupled with caring for his sick wife, who died in 1862, and caring for two small children, led to a breakdown in his health. At this time, he made a pastoral visit to somebody who was dying. And at that uh, visit, he met a gentleman who suggested that he needed to have a break in the country. And that gentleman gave him a letter to the secretary of the town and country mission. When Kendon went to meet that man he'd been recommended to meet, that man had just received a gift from a Miss Tapson who lived at Finchcock's. Goudhurst, now famous for its musical instruments. And the mission needed a minister. Kendon saw this as a direct intervention of God. And with three months' support promised, he moved to Goudhurst, trusting that the Lord would provide for his future, which he did, and soon further donations came in. There's another picture of him when he's a bit younger. And uh, there's John Burnham. He's quite distinctive because he's got a lovely quiff for his hairstyle. I'm thinking of that myself, but I haven't quite got enough hair at the moment. So uh, Kendon uh, came to Goudhurst. And there's a picture of Goudhurst. I'm sure many of us remember winding round the uh, road at the church. Very narrow still to this day. So there Kendon... Uh, found the people very ignorant of Christian matters. Mm -hmm. He rented a, a, a labourer's cottage for himself and his young family. That cost him two shillings a week. And then he began to go visiting and preaching and teaching. And eventually he gathered a small congregation. When uh, winter came and it was dark and cold, he couldn't do much in the open air. And the squire's wife had her heart touched and she pleaded with her husband to allow Kendon and his group of fellow believers to meet in an empty oast. So they went up this rickety ladder into this rather dimly lit and drafty place to meet every Sunday. Miss Tapson built him a little room later on to serve as a day school in the week and for Sunday services. Now, Burnham, whose picture we, we saw a moment or two ago, used to write articles in Spurgeon's magazine, The Sword and Trowel. And uh, in 1864, he records this. Here in 1864, seven believers, the Kendon family plus two, formed a church. These were days of sore struggle for our friend, and he often found it difficult to make ends meet. Yet, his trust in God remained unshaken, and his daily motto was Jehovah Jireh. Referring to those days, Kendon says, how often when we've been brought to our last penny and have not known how to provide for our children, have we been enabled to go to our heavenly father and tell him all our wants in simplicity and confidence, and in his own time and way, He's graciously sent the needed help. 
in 1871, a, a, a minister from Mayfield visited him and said, the church now numbers 40. There are 165 Sunday school scholars and 15 Sunday school teachers and five or six outlying preaching stations provided with ministers. And so after a short time, the Lord established his work with a congregation. So to augment, oh, sorry, to augment his meager income, he, in the phrases of the day, took a bin. So his family, uh, each autumn, would meet in the hop garden with their own bin. And they would toil from dusk to, from dawn to dusk. The annual influx from London brought an alarming amount of sin and suffering into the county. And as the parson, as they called him, stood at the bin, his ears often tingled with the profane jokes, the oaths, and the vulgar songs. At length, he felt he needed to do something. And he left his family to do the picking, and he went round the gardens to speak a word for Jesus and to leave tracts. Mrs. Spurgeon, who ran a book club, supplied him with tracts and booklets. But gradually, opposition and insult yielded to the influence of his life. And his presence became a check on sin, and from small beginnings began the Hop Picker's Mission, which soon was copied in other hop gardens around England. How did they go about their work? Well, obviously, they would go and, and meet the hoppers uh, at mealtimes. That was one way in which they could find that the hoppers were not working and they could engage them in conversation. And that, I'm pretty sure, is Kendon. Let me just say about the photos. The photos have kindly been provided to me by um, Kent County Archives. They had uh, left them over 200 pictures from the Hot Pickers Mission. So I've got images, um, but I can't see the back of the car, the photos, to know if there's anything that tells me anything. But I can certainly recognize Kendon in uh, many of the pictures, and I'm sure this is him for one of them. That's definitely him. Um, and uh, this is the way that they would go around. Um, there is definitely Kendon, um, and I'm not sure whether that's a gypsy wagon or whether that's the evangelist wa wagon. They would go around the camps on a Sunday morning and hold open air meetings. So that moves me on to the open air meetings or the camp services. Um, in 1875, somebody called Shrubshaw contributed this to the magazine called Word and Work. I quote, In addition to daily visits to the gardens, nightly meetings were held in the open air in different hamlets, extending over a radius of seven miles. Large numbers listened with unabated interest. The meetings were helped by musical instruments, which were wheeled from place to place in a barrow by Miss Wolf from Brinklow in Warwickshire and supported by singers, some who came from the school. Sankey's hymns and tunes seemed to awe and melt the multitude, some evidently feeling the power of the name of Jesus. Our expectations from God enlarged so much that we felt there was no need to count those who'd been blessed, since we could leave that till the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, fully persuaded that our labor had not been in vain in the Lord. So here, here, here they are in their open air meetings. Now, in 1889, there was a team of over a dozen missionaries 
uh, visiting annually, including Richard Burnham, who was one of the evangelists from Spurgeon's Metropolitan Tabernacle. Every autumn, requests for prayer and reports of the mission would appeal in the magazine Sword and Trowel. And you can see um, Kendon there um, on my front right, and you can see Richard Burnham sitting next to him with his very distinctive hairstyle, with his quiff, as my wife says. Um, and uh, what is evident is that the numbers coming down to work in the hot fields as evangelists uh, grew and grew and grew. Now, those of you who like dress will undoubtedly be able to doubt a, a date the photos, um, particularly from the ladies' hats. So there's a real good number coming down to work. So in his book, Chips from My Log, Burnham describes a typical day. Uh, he says, we start with prayer and set off with books and tracts. We set up to a bin with a hearty good morning and help the picker and begin, begin to chat, seeking to lead the conversation to spiritual matters. Now, I like this bit. Those, to those who will not talk, we sit and read a story such, a one, such as one of John Ashworth's strange tales. Now, I know some of our ladies have read those and love them. If it creates interest, we leave the track with them. We met one man who'd created his attire by cutting holes in two Hessian sacks. So we read him the story of the equally eccentric Billy Bray. To an, ine to an inebriated group, we bore testimony against sin and moved on. To a group of children, we told the story of the prodigal son and left them with a picture of the parable. To, com to a complete wreck of humanity, we provided garments on condition that he signed the pledge. He did so and wept. They prayed, then gripped his hand and expressed the hope that if spared to meet again, they would find him a new man in Christ next September. So here is uh, some of them uh, at the work mm -hmm. of going around visiting. Now that on my top left is clearly a very, very old photo. I'm not sure about the other photo on this screen. That might be a tally man. He looks almost like a gendarme, but um, he may have been um, uh, a, a, a Salvation Army guy. Uh, some of the places I could identify, that's um, Hazelden Farm, Cranbrook. So they would visit the camps and uh, uh, every uh, Sunday, two companies of workers would go to visit two to eight camps. They would often find the, the uh, men reading and the women washing and cooking and the children playing. They would uh, greet them, distribute a hymn sheet, of a well-known hymn to sing, read a portion of scripture, pray, and give a short talk before they moved on. This is a picture of some of the children's work. Clearly, these, the, 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 the children there must be a bit later at the top of my screen. There's a, another gathering of children, and I imagine that this is a gathering for a free tea. I can't be entirely sure, uh, but... <laughs> Uh, on Sundays, after visiting, they would come back home to prepare a three o'clock tea. And by four o'clock, they would have uh, a ring of four or five deep hundreds assembling uh, a vast diversity of humanity. Bread and butter was followed by cakes. Much was devoured, but some got slipped into pockets. Never forgotten going to Dick Saunders' church and watching the boys at the back slip the biscuits in, the chocolate biscuits in their pocket um, to take home. So after a gospel message, an invitation was in, given to come to evening worship. Often that was on a village green, but not all the villagers welcomed it. But sometimes up to a thousand would gather. Uh, 
Now, I think that's certainly going to be a thousand people that are gathered for an open air meeting. So the evening meetings would see them trimming their lamps, sorting their tracks and harnessing the horse to the cart before setting off. And they would go where the hoppers were likely to be. And the hoppers in the evening would likely to be at the local shop or at the local alehouse. The, 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 the open air work required a great deal of skill. Uh, it's quite interesting to see the photo. I'm, I'm very amused with, with, with the man um, uh, in the center there with his left arm out. He's probably saying, be quiet, uh, say cheese, um, clearly taking, uh, uh, preparing all, all this crowd for the photo. And I, I think this is probably with the children's work. But uh, the open air work required a great deal of skill. Again, this is clearly children. Um, and uh, you can see by their dress, the period. Uh, you can also see uh, the uh, social status to a certain extent of, of these poor children. Let's go back again. So how did they go about it? Well, um, they found great difficulty in holding the attention of their assemblies. Um, inexperienced evangelists couldn't cope with the back chat and the interruptions. Uh, the, a lot of the back chat especially came from the Irish travellers who were nominally Roman Catholic. Burnham said, we distribute invitations door to door and set up the port portable organ on the cart. Singers come from the school and we address the crowd with short messages, spiced with incident and anecdote. Interruptions are common. Sackman came up close with a feather headdress and another man kept interrupting. So the leader said, let's have a hymn and then our friends can have the platform. That ensured that he disappeared. One man started shouting at us in what he said was French, but the only creature that understood him was a nearby donkey who seemed to mim mimic him much to the, his embarrassment and the amusement of the crowd. So it was a real challenge to um, speak to these people, gain their attention and uh, get them to be sober and serious. These were some of the uh, conveyances that they'd used to travel around. These are the conveyances of the evangelists. Uh, there's a, a, a lovely picture. It's the gospel chariot. I'm not sure that it was Kendon's or whether it was another group. And clearly they, they, they've gathered a group there um, and are addressing them. It's another group. I think that's the same group again and another group um, that they would go round in to hold meetings. Now, let me move on to something else, another aspect of, of the ministry, medical care. Health was a problem. There were three special hop picking ailments. Hop rash, caused by scratches from the binds. Hop wrist, caused by strained ligaments due to the turning action when picking. And hop eye, which was inflammation of the eye caused by dust from the binds. That wasn't the only problem. Uh, there, was a there were terrible outbreaks of cholera and in 19, sorry, 1849, um, there was a very bad outbreak. And a wooden cross in East Farley Churchyard was erected in memory of 43 strangers. And of course, hoppers couldn't afford to pay for medical care. Another problem was food poisoning. One reason was that fish came down from London and by the time it arrived there unrefrigerated, it was bad. Meat that was sold on the farm would have been the cheapest cuts, and often it was drenched in vinegar and pepper to take away the foul smell. And so the ministers and the volunteers would distribute shoes and clothes to the shoeless, and medicine to the suffering, and visit the sick and the dying um, at hoppers' houses. 
1910, Richard Wilson, he was completely different than J.J. Gendon. He was a high church socialist from Stephanie. He brought the Rose and Crown public house in Five Oak Green and turned it into the Hoppers Hospital. So here we have care. And um, it's very interesting to watch this guy on my right um, taking the pulse of that poor man. Uh, clearly the doctor looks as serious as the poor man looks ill. <laughs> they say when there's an accident on the motorway, class slow, slow down to have a look. Very apparent when somebody has an accident, um, when they're hot picking, a crowd gathers to see what goes on. So here is, is uh, something that was provided, the Hopper's medical mission. And I think if you can just see the little boy under the nurse looks as though he's got a head bandage. So this is a, a hot picker's hospital and shelter. Kendon would have nurses uh, and a doctor come down from London each year in his later years. Now that's a very interesting photo. Um, this is one I dug out of that archive and clearly uh, you've got a black family and if you look to the right one of the medical the doctors or male nurses is also uh, a black man the writing on the picture is not clear enough for me to know exactly their name and there is some of the revision for medical care that was provided um, by the hot pickers mission this may be the guy i referred to called uh, richard wilson um, when he bought the pub, uh, he changed the name on the sign. The original sign said, E and H Kelsey's Fine Ales, Stout and Porter, not sold here. Uh, clearly, I think they just added the word on the sign. Um, one of the things that was provided was um, a hut for social meetings to try and get people away from the public houses. Education. In 1866, Kendon used a local barn, where for a fee of two pence a week, ah, there's, a, there's a job for your retired school teachers, two pence a week to teach the local children to read and write, to pray, how about that on your curriculum, to be kind, to be clean and neat, to be methodical and careful and serious and without charge to teach them to grow up. Well, that's a great curriculum, isn't it? I don't know how many teachers would want to take that on today, but clearly that was what Kendon was aiming to do with the children that paid him two pence a week. Well, his school grew. And uh, during his lifetime, 500 scholars passed through his hands. Many went on to posts of usefulness and some to Christian service. The school was mainly self-sufficient at first, thanks to produce from the gardens. It also gave work to local residents. But today, things are slightly different. It's, today, it's called Bethany School. It's in Curtis Green, which is a little hamlet. Um, outside of Goudhurst. I went to visit it some weeks ago and I've got a picture there. It's got 350 students now. Unfortunately, they're no longer educated at two pence a week. They're now paying £18,000 per <laughs> annum. So there's 55 teachers and 20, 27 support staff. So that was the adverts for Bethany House and the spin-off from that, which is the Ladies' College. Uh, the Baptist Chapel was built in 1878 for £700. It had a Sunday school room and the worshippers came for many miles around and uh, the J.J. Uh, Kendon, besides supporting the mission, was the pastor there during the whole of his life. It's now known as Bethany Memorial Chapel. It's used by the school. Sadly, it doesn't have a Baptist congregation anymore. And looking inside, it's very clear that there's no uh, evidence of it being evangelical. At Curtis N. Green, Kendon took the shop and made it the post office. There's a memorial to Kendon. It tells us that he was 
pastor there in that church for 42 years. He left mission work in London to recruit his health and by the Lord's leading commenced Christian work at Curtis Den Green, November 1861. The services were first in an oast house, but after a meeting room. In 1878, by the pastor's energy, this chapel and Sunday school were erected and here he continued his honorary ministry till his death. He was interred at, Gray, uh, at Goudhurst. He believed and preached the inspiration of Holy Scriptures, the power of prayer, and salvation alone through the merits of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. He was the founder of the hot picking mission to Kent. So, the secular press wrote in 1887, and this is Kendon's legacy. It's 1887 in the secular press. There was a time when the picking of hops brought a terrible increase of crime. But all that is changed now. The sanitary inspector, the excise officer, the energetic constable, and last, but by no means least, the self-denying band of Christian workers who by their kindly sympathy over the motley crowds have so altered the state of affairs that crime is scarcely heard of. Drunkenness is infrequent and the magistrates find their work little increased by the sudden influx of these <coughs> vagrant thousands." End of quote. J. Marsh in Hops and Hopping in 1892 wrote, the effect of, the effect of philanthropic missions is very remarkable on the improved character of the hoppers and the elevated moral tone of their lives. Supporters of the mission such as Spurgeon reflected like thus. It's a wonderful opportunity for getting at the real poor and feeding them with the gospel. While well, they also get a meal of daily bread, which some of them greatly need. They will go home to London with more knowledge of the gospel than they get for years in our great city, where hundreds of thousands never enter a place of worship. What of today? Now I took the two pictures here um, in September uh, when I visited uh, Pembury Road Baptist Chapel, Tunbridge, to take the services. I was entertained by James Bug, an elder and a local farmer, and he runs the family farm at Church Farm, Capel. It was once a farm with many acres of hops. Now all that remains of the hop picking industry are the hoppers' huts. Some like these are disused, but others James allows to be used by the families of former hoppers to have a short stay. There is the, the outside kitchen, uh, which of course would have been provided uh, in, in the days of hopping heyday. Now, when I visited in September, there was a gypsy mission being held in the centre of the huts and camps. Now, 25 years ago, the annual gypsy mission was based in my home village of Edgerton. And there, the lady there was a young girl and she remembers coming to our village for a gypsy mission in the 1990s. It was a joy for me to see that with these people coming out of London into the hopping huts, there were still those who were coming to bring the gospel to them. That's the quote I have from Spurgeon. I've quoted it to you a few moments. And that's where um, I end the talk. But I want to draw just one or two conclusions. What can we think about that as we, we think about hopping today? Well, it was the Lord's leading that led J.J. Kendon 
to leave the East End of London and come to the Hop Gardens. And he was the right man for the right time at the right place. It, it also tells us that Kendon was a man, and, and also Spurgeon's evangelist, saw opportunities to share the gospel. But not only that, they had a concern for the whole of the well-being of people. They provided food, shelter, clothing, medical care, as well as the gospel. We also have to remember that though Kendon had his own congregation based in Gouthurst, Curtis Den Green, so much of their work wouldn't have been known for its fruitfulness. They sowed a lot, but they didn't see big harvests, but they didn't know how much good they had done. The people returned, they might never ever have come back to the county of Kent. I think there's another thing that we can learn from Hopping Mission, and that is some gospel opportunities pass after a time. While the opportunity was there, the men of God used it and the women of God used it. Well, there's no longer a field to take the gospel to. There are no longer hop gardens or hoppers huts. That's something that has largely passed. And sometimes there are things that come to a natural end. So after reflecting on this tonight, our thoughts and prayers would surely be that the Lord would open more gospel opportunities and provide more gifted workers to go out into the harvest field in our time. Thank you very much for your patience in listening.